All right, friends, I still hear a little bit of an echo in this, but that's all right. We are going to go through the early church this week in Jerusalem. So last week we talked about Pentecost, Shavuot. If you have a bulletin, if you don't have a bulletin, there's some more somewhere. I don't know where they all are now. Oh, some right there. You can get some. All right, so let's read through these scriptures together. Um, I'll, I'll read aloud, and you can read along. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Real famous passage about the early church. And then I've included this other passage as well that comes just a couple chapters later. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them in them all, that, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the dis- apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. That's the passage. So there's a couple of insights from the early church and what they're like and and how the Holy Spirit is working through them. So what we're going to do in just four parts is we're breaking down pieces of the main chap of the main section Acts 2:42 through 47. So each of these sections in bold, it's literally it, it's just pulling it, copy and pasting it straight right out of the Bible, the apostles teaching. So this first part, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What does that mean? So Luke explains how the early church set their course. So if you look back in your bulletin, your worship folder, the first verse, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So verse 42 is kind of a summary of everything that follows. And then he elaborates. So it's an overarching verse, big picture. This is what it looked like in the church. And then verse 43, 44, 45. Then he's elaborating on what he's said in summary in verse 42. So the first part here, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So he's explaining how they've set their course. And then the following verses describe how these Christians lived. Okay, you catching that? So he's describing the big picture, and then he's describing that or explaining that how they live is integrally like you can't you can't separate it like it's intertwined like a rope, and you, if you start to un- unravel it, it all comes apart. So it's integrally connected to devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So these early Christians, these aren't people who did good deeds but didn't have a clue what these apostles taught. They are devoting themselves to what the first apostles taught. Peter, James, John, all all of them, they're studying, they're listening, they're like sponges, and they are devoting themselves to everything that the apostles taught, okay? Devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, both in word and deed. That's an important little parenthesis I added in there. There's a couple places in the Gospels that it says Jesus did miracles, and there, it describes the miracles Jesus did. And then it says the people were amazed at his teaching. Or in one place, kind of the, the word on the street was, quote, no one teaches like this man. And the couple examples where that happens in the Gospels, he's not said anything. It's describing what he's done. But the ancient understanding is your teaching, and we get this, right? We talk about this with parents. You, you can't, as a parent, you can't just tell them what to do. You must show them. Because we recognize that if you, what you're showing is different from what you're teaching, what are they going to pick up on and what are they going to actually mimic? 
what you've shown them. So we, we get this intuitively. Teaching is more than our words. It's how we live our life. So they're devoting themselves to everything that the apostles have been teaching, both in word and deed. And the apostles are teaching exactly what Jesus taught them. He commanded them this, right? The ascension we talked about a few weeks ago. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So one of Jesus' last words to his apostles are, teach the people to obey everything I have commanded you. So now, just a few days later, what are the apostles teaching? They're teaching everything Jesus taught them, what they learned for three years. And as surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the apostles are teaching what Jesus taught them. The next part here, the fellowship. Now, this space that we meet in is often, for the history of this church building, has been called the fellowship hall. And if you grow up in church circles, fellowship is a term that gets thrown around. It's a, it's a funny term. We church people use it in the rest of the world like fellowship. Oh, you hear that thunder? It's the Holy Spirit right there. Uh, we throw around the term fellowship like church potlucks or a small group time or whatever it is. Or, you know, after church you go out to eat and you go out get ice cream at Brom. That's fellowship. Well, that is part of it. But the way that Luke is using the word fellowship is pretty unique. So it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. The modern use of the word fellowship is not how it's used in this verse. It's really unfortunate <laughs> Bible translators have to continually come out with new translations because language is fluid. And how we used certain words only a few decades ago, a few generations ago, they change in such a small amount of time. So, so what maybe made sense years ago when a translation was used, well, people don't tend to use that word as much, but anyone have a favorite Bible translation where you always like to read out of the King James or the NASB or the NIV 1984, not the NIV 2011? Bible translators give in to the pressure of not updating words sometimes. So they stick with old words, even though people don't use the words that way anymore. Fellowship is one of them. Okay, so we're going to get nerdy, talk about the actual Greek here. So fellowship, so Luke, when he wrote this, the, he didn't write in English, he was writing in Greek. The word that's translated as fellowship in the Bible is a word koinonia. He actually wrote in a certain type of Greek called koine Greek, meaning common Greek. So you had fancy Greek, classical Greek, the language of the most edu ed educated, and then you had koine Greek, literally common Greek. It was the language of the commoners. He is using the word fellowship here Koinonia, the base of it is common. And he, he explains, he pretty much defines what this word is in a little bit when he says they have everything in common. So a koinonia, honestly the best modern uh, similarity we would have today is something like a co-op. Anyone grow up in more rural areas? There's a farmer's co-op or an electrical co-op or a water co-op and you're sharing these resources Anyway, so fellowship is translated from the Greek koinonia, to have things in common. And the best definition for how Luke uses fellowship in this passage is his description in verse 45. So you just have to keep looking. Often, if you have a question about the Bible, the Bible often answers the, bi the questions about the Bible. You just got to keep studying. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So what they had, they shared in common, in co-op, so to speak. Now, this passage gets explained away a lot, especially in the U.S., where we like the idea of private property. We like the American myth, and it is a myth, that you are a self-made man or woman. Uh, no, you're not. Everything you have is a gift from God, uh, and, and to some extent, you're also a product of things outside of your control. You had no control over where you were born, or the time you were born, or the parents to whom you were born, etc. The certain economic boom or recession, that during which you came of age and try to get your first job, etc. So there's all these things that are pushing against this, and we like to rationalize away and explain away this passage. But the fact of the matter is they're doing something here unique. Okay, so don't explain it away. This is an important verse. 
Luke is intentionally highlighting a behavior we are quick to minimize. So we try to gloss over this and like, well, yeah, they did it then, but it's different now. You know, capitalism is different. Or the people out there who need things now, well, they, they could work for it. You know, blah, 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 blah. And we, we rationalize it away. And it's not that there isn't some truth to those things. But you can't ignore the radical thing that they are doing here. And Luke, we know he's intentionally drawing attention to it because look at this fact. Luke was the only gospel writer to include these parables. Look at this list. The Good Samaritan. So an outsider who spends his money taking care of a Jew found nearly beaten to death on the side of the road. A Jew would have hated him and that the Good Samaritan spends his own money caring for this person. Luke. Only gospel writer to include that story. The rich fool, who this parable, Jesus says, this rich young fool, he, he has all this money and he says to himself, I've got so much wealth um, stored up in grain, basically, in agrarian society. He says, I need to build bigger barns to store all of my grain, all of my cattle, all of my, all of my grain and all that stuff, all of my money. And in the parable, Jesus says, God comes to him and says, you fool, tonight your life will be taken from you and you can't take any of this stuff with you. Luke's the only one to talk about that. God's great banquet, this other parable, Jesus says God is, it's like this banquet, and God is inviting people to come in, and, and people, they get the invitation, they RSVP back, say, oh, sorry, i got to take care of my cattle, i got to plow my field, i got business to attend to, and they're missing this opportunity because of the distractions of material wealth. And then um, this one, the dishonest manager, so he's not taking proper care of things and he's stealing money because of his own greed and he's punished for it. And then last, the rich man and Lazarus, where there's the story of this poor man and he's got covered in sores and he's a beggar outside of a rich man's house and the rich man never takes care of him and he dies and, and, and he's saying, Lord, please help me, help me. All of these stories about money and greed and not taking care of the poor Luke is the only gospel writer of the four gospel writers who share these stories. Luke is very intentional in pointing out to us when people are taking care of the poor and when they're not. He's worked hard to point this detail out. We can't just overlook it, okay? Here's a quote from John Piper. I was listening to a sermon on this particular passage. I respect John Piper. He loves God, but I disagree with him on lots of stuff he says. So, uh, FYI, if you're ever reading John Piper, but this quote is is good and powerful. He says, The radical fellowship of Acts chapter 2, 44 through 45 was the antidote, not anecdote like story, but antidote. So, if you get a snake bite, there's an antidote, an antivenom to protect you. An antidote is something that that repels or counteracts a poison or, or some, you've ingested something that's acting like poison in your body. It says the radical fellowship of Acts 2, 44 through 45 was the antidote for the suicide of materialism committed by the man who built bigger and bigger barns and lost his soul. So he's saying the same gospel writer who is the only one to share the story about a man who hoards his wealth. And in the parable, it's it's basically what kills him because God, as discipline, comes to him in his greed and says, I'm taking your life. John Piper in this quote is saying, the antidote to that type of suicide, the reversal to that type of self-inflicted death is to practice what the Christians are practicing in Acts 2, 44, or 40, yeah, 44 and through 45, to self-sacrificially give away to those in need rather than hoard up more and more. The next part here, the breaking of bread. It says they devoted themselves to not just the apostles' teaching, but also to the breaking of bread. Luke elaborates how they broke bread in verse 46. He goes on, he says, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. That's kind of an interesting phrase. The glad phrase, the glad and sincere hearts, tells us how precious these shared meals were to the early church. And this is an odd way to talk about sharing meals together. They did so with glad and sincere hearts. What's going on 
on here. They are understanding that this isn't just a church potluck. Something special is happening here when we eat together, and we are glad about it. We are so thrilled that we get to eat with other believers. They understood that this type of time together with other believers was special and should be cherished. They don't take it lightly, which means they don't skip out as soon as they have a chance either because these are special times. If you are rejoicing at the opportunity to spend time with fellow believers, are you going to be finding an excuse anytime you can to skip out on that gathering? No, because you understand it's special prayers. They devoted themselves to prayer. Something else. What's going on here? Here's this quote from, again, one of my heroes, George Mueller. He says, when we pray, we speak to God. This exercise of the soul can be best performed after the inner man, he's writing 150 years ago, we would also say the inner woman, so the inner person, has been nourished by meditation on the Word of God. Through His Word, our Father speaks to us, encourages us, comforts us, instructs us, humbles us, and reproves us. These are all of the things that God is doing to us and in us as we read His Word, His Bible. We may profitably meditate with God's blessings, although we are spiritually weak. So you're saying as we pray, prayer is more than talking to God. It's listening to God. Literally sitting silent, listening to Him, but also listening to the words He's already spoken to you and me in the Bible. Jaden's got a great Bible over there. It's a big, thick one, man. Hold that thing up. Look how thick that is. I mean, it, it doesn't. you don't grasp how, how many words are in the Bible when it's just on your phone, but she's got a big old honking one over there. There's a lot of words God has said to you and me. So when someone asks me, he says, I, I, really, I just don't hear God. And that the first question that comes into my mind, it's not necessarily always the first question I ask them out loud. They say, I don't hear God. I want to know, how much time are you reading your Bible? Because God is spoken a lot. Like thousands and thousands and thousands of words. And as we read His Word, that's communicating with God. He speaks to us, we listen. We speak to Him, He listens. So prayer is more than what we think of as prayer. Reading your Bible, that's prayer. It's communing, talking with God. See, some of these words that He's spoken to you, and He speaks to us daily, He actually spoke them a few thousand years ago. You just didn't know it, right? So, when he speaks to Isaiah, he's also speaking to you today. When he was speaking to the early church in Corinth through the Apostle Paul, he's speaking to you today. And if you open up your Bible, or turn on your Bible, however you read it, God is speaking. And if you listen, that's prayer. And Miller is saying, prayer is more than talking to God. It's listening to Him. And as we listen, He's doing all those things. And even if you are weak, so someone said to me recently, they, they were using the phrase, of, talking about renovation community, and said, I need renovation. Like, I'm a fixer-upper. Well, we all are, right? But they were, they were explaining that they're, they're spiritually weak. They're struggling. They're not having spiritual victory right now. And what they're saying here, although we were, we were spiritually weak, if we have this posture, like the early church, devoting ourselves to prayer, reading our Bibles, praying with other believers, praying on our own, even if we are weak, we're going to hear from God. He's going to bless us as we focus on His Word. Now, don't be surprised if you're not praying on your own, you're not praying with others, and, and you're not getting into His Word and praying with a posture of prayer as you read the Bible, well, yeah, you're probably going to struggle. Yeah, you're not going to hear from Him as much. Yeah, you're going to struggle with sins that that you thought you'd beat by now, right? Although uh, we may profitably meditate with God's blessing, although we are spiritually weak. Whether they gathered to eat in homes or in the temple, so Luke now in this passage, he's explaining both. 
They spend a bunch of time in the temple worshiping, but then it says they gather together in homes, eating with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, and more prayer. So whether they're gathered in homes or praying in the temple, their focus was directed on God. I, I heard a message on this, and he, he stopped to clarify. This doesn't mean that you can't have fun. <laughs> You give the example of like playing a board game together as a family. This doesn't mean that if you're gathered with other Christians, the only thing you're doing is have a Bible study. You can watch a show together, play a game together, go for a walk, all these things. You know, you keep living life, but do so with a God-centered focus. So I try to do this just with our boys. If it's a nice day and we're outside playing, I just speak a little word reminding them, have it and I say it out loud. It's just a prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for a nice day. Let's thank Jesus for a nice day. And they repeat, yeah, thank you, Jesus, for a nice day. And we go on swinging. Or we go on playing. Whatever it is we're doing. But are trying to direct the focus towards God. Everything we have is from Him. So their focus was directed on God. And they were devoted to communing with God. So when they're in the temple... They're communing with God in worship and prayer and praise. When they're breaking bread with other believers, with glad and sincere hearts, they're communing with God, recognizing, wow, God, this is a gift. Thank you for it. When they're selling their possessions and they're giving them away to those in need, they're communing with God, recognizing, God, I don't need this. You've given it to me, and you're allowing me to bless someone else. And that's communing with God in whatever they're doing. Now, What's going on here? Why? What caused these early Christians to be so radical in what they're doing? So I'm going to jump and I'm going to make an interpretation here. It's an interpretive leap. Others might interpret it this way, different ways. This is why I think what they, why they did what they did. It's because of this. Because they were filled with awe. And I've put in, in parentheses here, parentheses, the Greek. The NIV 2011 version, I don't remember the older version, translates, translates it this way, filled with awe. And I think that's a terrible, terrible translation because when we hear in modern ears, with modern ears, the words awe, we are thinking of something awe-inspiring, something that's really cool like the Grand Canyon or the Niagara Falls, and we're not hearing any connotation of fear. And the word in Greek, and the ways it's used, this exact same word is used in other parts of the Bible, it's very clear this is an awe with a good tinge of fear mixed in. So the same word, they were filled with awe, shows up other places in the New Testament like the shepherds were phobos when they see the angels. This is a common place you see it in New, New Testament. Angels appear to people and then the word phobos shows up. Phobos is the Greek. Phobos has to do with fear. Any word in our modern English that sounds like phobos? Phobia. Yes. So the, our modern word phobia, when someone has a phobia of something, they have an extreme fear. Arachnophobia, um, fear of spiders. What's the one fear of heights? I forget what that one is. You know. Agoraphobia, fear of being in large crowds. The, word, the Greek word is phobos. So when it shows up in other places, you have people falling on their faces frightened to death because angels have appeared. And the angels say, do you not know fear? Do you not know phobos? You know, and that's, that's the idea here. So when you read in your NIV, NIV, they were filled with awe. It just doesn't, it doesn't do it justice. Okay? So what's going on here is there's awe, yes, but there's awe mixed with fear. So think of it this way. You can have thoughts filled with awe as you are standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. And just plain old awe is happening as you are standing on the edge, safely behind 
the reinforced steel barricades that protect you from falling off the edge. Staying at that exact same point with no barricades between you and falling down a mile to your death, you get a better idea of the type of awe that Luke is explaining here. Yeah, it's all like, wow, isn't that awesome? But it's, wow, isn't that awesome? Oh my goodness, I better be careful. That awesome thing could also kill me. So it's looking with awe from a safe distance on a boat as you're going through Niagara Falls. I went there when I was 14, and the Maid of the Mist is this boat that gets you close, and, and you stay a safe distance away. But awe, as it's talking about in the New Testament, is swimming in the water at the base of Niagara Falls, looking up, yes, thinking it's cool, but also thinking, oh my goodness, I hope I don't die. Okay? That's what's going on here. It's, wow. God is moving in a mighty, powerful way, and His power is being displayed to such an extent that, oh my goodness, I need something protecting me. Because that same power that sent in the water over the falls could kill me. Right? The same power that carved the channel in the Great in the Grand Canyon, whew, I could fall over the edge and die. That's what's going on here. They're filled with phobos. All mixed with a healthy dose of fear. Okay? So at last, in-laws took us on a cruise, and we had this balcony unit. It was great. Praise God for in-laws to take you on a cruise. It was wonderful. And I loved just standing on the balcony looking out of the ocean. I mean, it was just so cool. And our, our, our room was probably something like, I don't know, 10 stories up from the ocean. I just stand there all day long looking at the edge of that. It was really cool. I wasn't afraid take away the balcony, I'd feel a little different, right? I loved watching the ocean, but as long as the balcony was there, I wasn't fearful of the ocean, okay? That's what's going on. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So the result, here's this, the result of a reverential fear, not fear like, oh my goodness, God is going to hurt me, but fear like, Wow, I am seeing God's power and I am reminded just how powerful God is. So their actions are the result of a reverential fear for God and the unique work He's doing in His new church. They're seeing miracles performed and that's a sign of God's power. And that's amazing. But if you've got a head on straight, that should put a little healthy dose of fear in you. And so the radical changes in heart and their use of time and their use of resources come after they see God's power displayed. And it changes them. So Pentecost, Shavuot, like we talked about last week, they see that power. They see 3,000 people get saved in one day. And you're reminded, oh my goodness, the same God who can save 3,000 people in one day also, as we talked about, also can bring about death to 3,000 people in one day. The same God who can raise to life can also kill. The same God who can move in mighty ways and bring light. It's like a tornado, right? It's kind of beautiful to look at from far away and you get up close and realize, oh my goodness, this has power to bring death. And it brings this awe and it changes your course of direction, right? Tornado's coming. Let's look for a storm shelter or the nearest bathtub, whatever. And that's what's happened. They see the mighty hand of God and they change course accordingly. And it changes how they act. And they see that God can miraculously provide for their needs, for example. If He can do these mighty works, then He can put food on my table so I can confidently sell a few things to help my fellow brothers and sisters in the church who need money to eat. They change their course. If God is this powerful, He could save me if I need saving. I don't need financial, economic saving right now, but my brother or sister does, and I can help. So I'm going to sell some things to help them, and I'm confident 
that the same God who has who has displayed mighty power right right now will display mighty power in my life when I need saving, if and when the time comes. So I will freely give to those in need right now. Because I got it, and I'll share it. So here's a couple of examples. This bike. So we had 51 guests with us this week at church. Most of them were here uh, last week in our worship service. 51 guests helping us. They did so much work around here, not only with our summer day camp and feeding program, but work around here. And they helped us work on some of these bikes that need a little work. We received 22 bicycles from Walmart in a Walmart warehouse via the Fourth Police Department. We never asked for them. Didn't have any inkling. Wasn't praying. We weren't praying for them. God just provided. And then we've been able to already bless eight uh, Indian college students at UT Arlington from Pastor Pramal's church with bikes. And now we've got more bikes that we're trying to f- figure out what to do with. We need to fix them up. A few of them have a few things needed. I mean, God just gave us 22 bicycles. So here is an Amazon package filled with a few toys and giveaways and things like that for our summer day camp and feeding program. This one has a few trinkets, just some fun toys and things for our our day camp. Also what arrived a few days ago were three large boxes of food from the Amazon pantry, snacks that we're now giving out for our extended care time in our day camp, as well as some snacks for our our interns to, to eat, stuff I never asked for took me a while to figure out even who they were from. Um, somehow, it was an old friend that I knew from elementary school that I probably haven't personally talked to since, you know, and the, the, even then it was just passing in the halls in high school. I haven't seen this person since probably 2002, 2003. And they sent all this stuff. Never asked for it. Really wasn't even praying for it. God just provided this stuff. If you if you follow the stories of how I share God's stories of what God does in our church on social media, I'm regularly posting pictures of, of gifts, uh, usually checks that people have sent our church to do the work that we do in the summertime. Gifts that I don't ask people for. I, I worked in the nonprofit world for years, Christian nonprofit world, and in the nonprofit world, Christian and secular, just a key component of any nonprofit. It's fundraising. You have some nonprofits who have entire departments dedicated to fundraising because you constantly got to bring in more money and you got to ask more people for money and there's never enough money so you got to constantly think of new ways to bring in money. I don't fundraise. I don't have a plan to ever fundraise. I, it's not that it's wrong. I, I just see examples like this coming in over and over and over and over, mighty, powerful examples in our, honestly, tiny church. I mean, we do a nine-week summer day camp and feeding program with daily computer lab, daily chapel, um, daily career speakers. We're bringing in youth groups from throughout the country to learn what we do. And now I have a youth pastor from this last group that just went back They're now talking about how they can start to replicate some of what we do at their big church. They're asking about some of the resources that we were using in chapel, and they want to take them back to their big church, and they're learning from us. We've got interns coming throughout throughout the country coming in, and yet we're tiny. We are a great example of his strength is made perfect in weakness. We can't do in our own church's strength, what goes on this summer. But God gives and gives and gives. And it's literally, as a pastor, it has altered my course of direction. Because I keep seeing God's power displayed. I keep seeing Him bring resources and bring people to make unique ministry happen to the poor that I never asked for. And God did it. That's what's going on here in Acts. God, or the people of God, see God move in special ways, and they say, wow, I guess God is moving here. Let's adjust our actions to keep in step with what God is doing. Let me close with this quote. What time is it? 
4.56. You're welcome. I went over last week, so we're, we're finishing on time, definitely on time today. So here's a quote from C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's um, from one of his books in the Chronicles of Narnia series. And The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it's, it's basically, you would call it an allegory of, of Christian life, or at least parts of it are allegorical. And so the main hero in the Chronicles of Narnia is a lion, like a big lion. And he's symbolic of Christ. And so there's this famous wardrobe, you know, and they go through it, and they're in Narnia now, and they're talking to a, this young girl, Susan, is talking to a talking beaver. And she's asking about Aslan, who's this symbolic fig- figure of Christ, and she learns that he's not a man, he's a lion. And the beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. That's God. God is not safe, but he's good. And so just like meeting face-to-face with Aslan a lion, and yeah, you should feel a little nervous, the early church recognizes, no, God, most visible in our time right now in Acts 2 as the Holy Spirit moving amongst us, no, he's not safe. Uh Uh-uh. He's not safe. In fact, we'll continue to read and study in Acts. No, this same Holy Spirit will actually lead us to things that will lead some of them to martyrdom. No, he's not safe. But he's good. He's not safe. So, yes, we have awe of what he's doing, but we also have a healthy fear. Like, oh my goodness. He is powerful to guide my steps. And, oh my goodness. What if I choose to disobedient, to be disobedient, and I stop following the path that he has most clearly laid out for this church or for me? He's not safe, but he's good. That's what the church is understanding here. And that's what we need to understand. He's not safe. He will lead you to do crazy things, like be a pastor of a honestly, a pretty tiny church, and do a massive, massive, massive ministry that they were asking me this week. I said, do other churches do what you do? And I, I, I said what I've told before. Um, surely they're probably out there. Um, we keep looking for them because we want to pick their brains and share best, best practices. But I told them my honest reply. I, I've yet, since summer of 2014, I have yet to see any church, any ministry, anywhere in the world that do, does what we do. Now, I'm sure they're out there. Right? We, surely we're not that unique. Or maybe they're just too busy posting stuff online. They, they haven't self-promoted. You know, they're too busy doing the work of ministry, so we haven't found them yet. But when we find them, we'll say, oh, please tell us all your best practices. We want to learn from you. But we are pretty unique. But I think, and I'm reminded, when we continue to give gifts that we never asked for, And God provides us like 51 people like last week to help us do what we can't do on our own. No, God's not safe. He leads me and He will lead you into scary waters. But He's good. And He's the King, I tell you. And if we follow Him, we will never go astray. If He calls us to give sacrificially and sell what we have to give to the poor... He's not safe, but he's good. He's a king, I tell you. If he calls you to go down a path that seems absolutely absurd and it doesn't seem like there's any money down that path, it doesn't seem like it makes sense, all the people are saying, no, 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 no. Well, listen, because they, they might be right. You might be fooling yourself. But if it's really, really God telling you to do something as absurd as what Barnabas does here in Acts 4, sell your fields? And give them to the poor? Well, if it really is God leading you to do that, He's not safe, but He's good. 
and he's the king, and the king will always provide for his loyal people. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, but more than that, we know that you love us. You're not safe. You lead us down scary paths. We're reminded that Jesus invited his followers to get into the boat and led them straight into a scary storm. But you are the king. You're the king of the universe. You're on the cattle on a thousand hills. And, and we are reminded in this passage tonight, in Acts 2 and then again in Acts 4, that we can trust you as we sacrificially give to our brothers and sisters who are in need. And we can trust you that as we radically devote our time to studying your teaching, being in fellowship with other believers, and giving to them sacrificially, that you will not let us down as we practice and live out that type of radical obedience to you. Now, it's, it's not safe, but it's good because it's the model of the good king who knows our needs, who lived for us and died for us that we may live for him. We thank you for the early church and their model of obedience for us today in 2019. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.